Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Please be seated. Our thoughts are with Gail as she now receives the help she needs. For those of you tuning in online, um, we had someone in the front pew faint, and, but she is alert and conscious and has been taken by EMTs um, outside, and so we pray for her healing. I also know that I basically need to restate the gospel so that you know what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> but the recurring line throughout my sermon is, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. I kid you not. And so as we do this sermon today, I want you to think of your own ailment, which you need to be set free from, but also for Gail for her continued healing. It's easy to fall into a simplistic duality with today's gospel lesson. Either the Pharisees are hopelessly rigid, or Jesus is indeed breaking Sabbath law and needs to be confronted. Both of these simplistic interpretations are incomplete because they rest on a faulty understanding of who Jesus is, and we need to establish that right at the beginning for this story to make any sense. Jesus is the Son of God, and as the Word of God made flesh, Jesus can say and do things in the power of God that are beyond the scope of normal religious practice. Jesus represents the interests of God, and God's abiding concern throughout salvation history is setting people free. We should see today's story not as a dust-up between two equal opposing points of view, but as Jesus acting in the power of God to liberate those who are in physical, emotional, or spiritual bondage. Only if we understand that Jesus is speaking in God's voice Will we avoid lazy characterizations of Pharisees on the one hand or simplistic understandings of Jesus on the other? Because that's the mistake Pilate made when he condemned Jesus to crucifixion. He could only see the outrage of the Jewish leaders on the one hand and the silent resistance of Jesus on the other. He saw them as equally matched. He didn't understand that in condemning Jesus to death, he was actually ensuring God's victory over death, for the resurrection is the ultimate act of divine liberation. So let's look at today's gospel story to get a sense of who Jesus is, what God is most concerned about, and how we might behave as a result. In today's story from Luke, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he sees a woman with a spirit that has crippled her for 18 years. She's bent over. She can't stand up. And while there are modern-day maladies that match this description, it's interesting that Luke specifies that her condition is the result of an unclean spirit. She's caught by something that is causing her physical deformity. She doesn't just need healing. She needs to be set free. Jesus immediately notices the woman and calls her over. And without a word of introduction, he says, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. He lays hands on her, and immediately she stands up straight and begins to praise God. Repeatedly in the gospel stories, Jesus sets people free. He sets them free from demons. He sets them free from illness. He sets them free from loneliness, from hardness of heart. By word and deed, Jesus fulfills God's ancient command, let my people go. Jesus understood his mission clearly. When he was beginning his public ministry, he read this passage from Isaiah in the synagogue. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. Even though Jesus understood his mission well, those around him did not. His disciples were confused. John the Baptist was confused. His own family was confused. He consistently proclaimed the freedom of God, but those closest to him thought he was missing the mark. It was only after his followers witnessed the aftermath of the resurrection that they realized that God's purpose is to set us free. 
What has a hold on you? What sin is sucking the life out of you? What attitude is making you smaller than you need to be? What behavior is shutting you down rather than opening you up? What fears are controlling your heart and mind? Jesus came to set you free so that you might have life and have it abundantly. I have a strong memory of God setting me free once, and it's not your typical story. I was a freshman at Wheaton College, and I was part of a tight-knit theater group that encouraged prayer, play, authentic relationships. It was one of the strongest Christian communities I've ever known. One night in mid-December, we gathered at the director's house to celebrate Christmas and exchange gifts. To my horror, I was assigned to give my gift to the strongest, most talented, most intimidating woman in the senior class. Her name was Darla. I had no idea what to give her. And then I remember that in the production of Godspell that fall, she had sung that sultry cabaret version of Turn Back. O oh man, forswear thy foolish ways. Old now is earth, and none may count her days. Da na 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 na. And so, throwing caution to the wind, I decided that my Christmas gift to her would be to dress in sexy clothes, to squat down in a cardboard box, to have my friends drag that box into the center of the circle, and then climb out singing that song. Friends, that is freedom. <laughs> it was a hit. Everyone cheered while I sang and danced around the living room, and Darla almost died laughing. Sometimes God's freedom comes in strange places. And later that night, as we sat in the circle and talked about what we had learned in the first half of the year, I found myself crying as I talked in the group about the joy of being part of community that accepted me as I am. There was a touch of heaven in the room that night. I could hear Jesus saying to me, you are set free from your ailment. Come, follow me. In today's gospel story, the leader of the synagogue didn't know what to do with this kind of freedom. It was very unusual. It was dangerous. It needed to be controlled and contained. Frightened by this display of godly power, the leader of the synagogue said to those gathered, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. He's not wrong, but Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. How did Jesus respond to him? You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give water? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. The crowd rejoiced at everything he was doing. Jesus was simply putting into action what Isaiah had said hundreds of years before, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. Jesus sets us free, but we have to learn what to do with our freedom. God's freedom isn't just about serving our interests. God's freedom isn't just about maximizing our wealth or satisfying our pleasures. God's freedom always leads to worship, praise, and care for others. God's freedom always builds up the kingdom of God. Why did Moses tell Pharaoh to set God's people free so they could worship God in the wilderness? What did the bent over woman do as soon as she was freed from her ailment? She praised God. What did I do with the freedom I found in the theater community at Wheaton? I gathered twice a week for four years to breathe, pray, stretch, play, and engage in trust exercises with my colleagues. By my disciplined presence with this group, I grew in freedom. And when you come to church, when you show up for worship, you are growing in God's freedom. As we begin a new program here at St. Michael, you are invited to come to the altar just as you are, bent over, pressed down, closed up, or tightly bound. 
as we worship together, learn together, serve together, you will hear Jesus say, you are set free from your ailment. And it will lead to prayer and praise and service. There may be resistance within you or around you. A very serious voice may tell you that you're deceiving yourself, that your newfound freedom is out of line, that your joy needs to be contained, that you're not following the rules. But every time we take communion or witness a baptism or see young people being confirmed or attend an ordination or receive absolution or accept anointing for healing, we remember that God has set us free. God gives us the sacraments of signs of Christ's liberating work in the world. I began today with a reading from Deuteronomy. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The purpose of the Sabbath is to remember that God has set us free and all the other days of the week are spent extending that freedom to others. Amen.